This is Space Time Series 23, Episode 97. Coming up on Space Time, the possibility of life below the surface of Mars, Rocket Lab formally licensed to launch from Wallops Island, and astronomy under threat from Elon Musk's Starlink constellation. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study suggests there's enough evidence for liquid water below the Martian surface to make it the prime target in the search for life on the red planet. The findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, suggest the presence of traces of subsurface water on Mars raises the question of the possibility, at least, of a life-supporting environment. Although no life has ever been detected on the Martian surface, the new evaluation suggests the conditions just below the surface could potentially support it. The Martian subsurface, which is less harsh and has traces of water, is subjected to a steady bombardment of penetrating galactic cosmic rays, which could provide the energy needed to catalyze organic activity. The study's lead author, Demetra Attree from New York University, says there's growing evidence suggesting the presence of an aqueous environment on ancient Mars, raising the question of at least the possibility of a life-supporting environment. However, the erosion of the Martian atmosphere resulted in drastic changes to its climate. Surface water disappeared, shrinking habitable spaces on the planet, with only a limited amount of water remaining near the surface in the form of brines and water ice deposits. Life, if it ever existed on the red planet, would have to adapt to these harsh modern conditions, which include low temperatures and surface pressure, as well as high doses of radiation. The subsurface of Mars, that's the first, say, two metres or so below the surface, does have traces of water in the form of water ice and brines. And importantly, it would also undergo radiation-driven redox chemistry. Using a combination of space mission data, computer models, and studies of deep cave ecosystems on Earth, Atri proposes mechanisms through which life, if it ever existed on Mars, could survive and be detected. He says the joint European Space Agency Roscosmos ExoMars mission, which is slated for launch in 2022, is carrying the Rosalind Franklin rover, which is equipped with sensors designed to detect any signs of life. The mission will drill down into the Martian soil, where it can look for signs of any subsurface biological activity. Atri hypothesizes that galactic cosmic radiation, which can penetrate several meters below the surface, would induce chemical reactions that can be used for metabolic energy by organisms using mechanisms already seen in similar chemical and radiation environments right here on Earth. This is Space Time. Still to come, Rocket Lab formally licensed to launch from Wallops Island in the United States and the mysteries of auroral beads. All that and more coming up on Space Time. The United States Federal Aviation Administration has formally licensed Rocket Lab to begin flying its Electron rocket from its new launch pad at NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on the Virginian Mid-Atlantic Coast. Rocket Lab Launch Complex 2 will supplement the company's existing launch operations from its Mahia Peninsula facility on the east coast of New Zealand's North Island. The FAA Green Light will allow the company to increase its launch schedule to carry out some 130 launches a year across a range of different orbital inclinations. Rocket Lab's first Wallops Island launch will be the STP-27RM mission slated for launch on September 30. It'll carry the Monolith Research and Development Satellite into orbit for the US Air Force. Monolith will test a new space weather instrumentation package. The Wallops Island facility will primarily target US missions. And included in that will be Rocket Lab's first mission to the moon. NASA's using Electron for a mission to lunar orbit. It'll be in support of the Artemis project to return humans to the lunar surface and eventually onto Mars and beyond. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence says NASA expects to have astronauts on the lunar surface by 2024. The CIS Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment, or CAPSTONE for short, 
will use Rocket Lab's electron launch vehicle and its photon satellite platform to study the lunar near rectilinear halo orbit, which will eventually be used for NASA's new Lunar Gateway space station. The orbit keeps spacecraft in a sort of gravitational neutral zone known as the Earth-Moon Lagrange or L1 position. It's a place where the gravitational forces of the Earth and Moon balance each other out, thereby allowing a spacecraft placed in that orbit to remain in position relative to both the Earth and the Moon as the Moon orbits around the Earth. Capstone will validate navigation technologies and verify the dynamics of the halo-shaped orbit for future missions. It'll allow the Gateway Space Station to act as a staging post for missions down to the lunar surface. This is Space Time. Still to come, the mysteries of aurora beads and astronomy under threat from Elon Musk's Starlink constellation. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. We all want to further our knowledge and keep learning. After all, that's why you're listening to Space Time. And that's also why I think you'll love The Great Courses Plus, because that's what it's all about, learning. It's a fantastic streaming service founded on the idea that education should be available to everyone. And they make it possible to learn from the brightest minds out there. People most of us would otherwise never have access to. Professors from the best universities on the planet like Harvard, Yale and Stanford. And experts from National Geographic and the Smithsonian. This is college level learning. But without student loans, without the pressure of homework or grades and without the need to reside in the United States. It's learning for the pure pleasure of learning. And the Great Courses Plus app makes it possible to learn whichever way works best for you. Watch or listen to lectures at any time, anywhere. Now, this week I've been looking at a course which popped up in my recommended for you list all about the Higgs boson. It's delivered by Professor Sean Carroll, a senior research associate in physics at Caltech. That's only a short course, just 12 lectures long, but as the course description says, it provides a fascinating dive into the world of modern particle physics. Let's just see how the Higgs, the so-called God particle, is the missing piece of a scientific puzzle that helps us understand the rules of the universe. I found it a fascinating course. And you too can unlock a world of knowledge with The Great Courses Plus. And as a space-time listener, you get to check out any course or lecture for free. That's free access to their entire library. So don't wait any longer. Sign up today using our special URL. Start your free trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That way they'll know you've come from us and you'll be helping to support our show. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And of course you can find the URL details in the show notes and on our website. And now it's back to our show. is Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists have begun to uncover some of the secrets of auroral beads, a strange type of celestial display which drapes east to west across the night sky like a glowing pearl necklace. Auroral beads often appear just before large auroral displays and are associated with events known as substorms. Substorms are brief disturbances in Earth's magnetosphere, causing energy to be released from the magnetospheric tail and injected into the high-latitude ionosphere. But the cause of auroral beads has remained a mystery. The Sun produces a constant stream of charged particles, primarily protons, electrons and alpha particles, which are really helium nuclei. This is the solar wind, and it bathes our entire solar system. But occasionally, the Sun also generates powerful plasma eruptions known as coronal mass ejections, and these generate geomagnetic storms, also known as space weather or solar storms. Now, if pointed towards the Earth, one of these solar storms can slam into the planet's magnetosphere, and they're then funneled along the planet's magnetic field lines into the upper atmosphere, where they collide with hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen atoms and molecules in the atmosphere, causing these atoms and molecules to glow in auroral displays known as the Aurora Borealis and Aurora Australis, the northern and southern lights. But because they're composed of charged particles, they can also damage spacecraft. They can increase radiation exposure for astronauts. They affect communications and navigation systems. They cause power blackouts on the planet's surface. 
and because they physically affect the atmosphere, causing it to literally expand and contract, they can increase atmospheric drag, causing spacecraft orbits to decay faster. The new study, reported in both the Geophysical Research Letters and in the journal Geophysical Research, shows that auroral beads which precede auroral displays are caused by turbulence in the plasma surrounding the Earth. The findings are based on computer models using both ground observations as well as data from NASA's Time History of Events and Macroscale Interactions During Substorms mission, Themis. The observations show that the turbulence is caused by lighter and more agile electrons, but moving with the momentum of particles 2,000 times heavier, which could develop into a full-scale auroral substorm. By modelling the near-Earth environment on scales from tens of kilometres up out to 1.5 million kilometres out, Themis scientists were able to show how plasma from the Sun interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, creating buoyant bubbles of plasma behind the Earth. Imbalances in the buoyancy between the bubbles and the heavier plasma in the magnetosphere creates fingers of plasma more than 4,000 kilometres wide, which then stretch down towards the Earth. And signatures of these fingers create the distinct bead-shaped structure in the aurora. Scientists now want to figure out how, why and when auroral beads trigger full-blown substorms. Now, in theory, the fingers could be tangling magnetic field lines, causing an explosive event known as magnetic reconnection. This would release a lot of energy and create a full-scale substorm and auroras that fill the night sky. Since its launch in 2007, the five spacecraft that make up the Themis constellation have been taking detailed measurements as they pass through the magnetosphere in order to better understand the causes of substorms that lead to aurorae. In its primary mission, Themis was able to show that magnetic reconnection is a prime driver of substorms. The new results highlight the importance of structures and phenomena on smaller scales, those hundreds to thousands of kilometres across, as compared to those spanning millions of kilometres. Themis principal investigator Vasilis Angelopoulos from the University of California, Los Angeles, says confirming that auroral beads are formed as part of the same process that triggers substorms is an important new piece in the puzzle. He says the data will ultimately help scientists better understand the swirling structures seen in aurorae. This report from NASA TV. Right before auroras dance in the sky, there's often an appearance of a mysterious shape. It drapes across the sky like a glowing pearl necklace. Scientists call them auroral beads. Structures like these can reveal how Earth's magnetic field interacts with solar material gushing through space. Understanding these interactions better could help scientists protect low-Earth orbiting satellites from extreme solar events. But until now, how the beads form has been a mystery. With the help of NASA satellites and computer models, scientists have the first evidence of how auroral beads form. All auroras are created when charged particles from the sun are first trapped in Earth's magnetic environment and are then funneled into the atmosphere. But scientists are now realizing that small changes in the magnetic environment can cause big differences in how the aurora can look. To analyze the auroral beads in more detail, scientists took observations from NASA's Themis mission. Three of the Themis spacecraft study near-Earth phenomena that triggers auroras. Scientists then combined Themis observations with ground measurements and powerful computer models. The result is a simulation of the near-Earth environment that scientists can analyze on scales from tens of miles to 1.2 million miles. They found that when particularly large streaming clouds of plasma from the sun reached Earth's magnetic field, they created buoyant bubbles of plasma behind the planet. Just like a lava lamp, the buoyancy between the bubbles and heavier plasma creates fingers of plasma about 2,500 miles wide that stretch down towards Earth, creating the distinct pearl necklace structure in auroral beads. From the ground, the beads average about 30 miles wide. Scientists hope these models will also be able to explain other small-scale structures seen in the auroras. The new results show us that even small, short-lived events within auroras can be linked to big global phenomena in our near-Earth environment.
After several delays due to bad weather, SpaceX has launched another 60 Starlink satellites, bringing its total constellation to 720. The 12th Starlink mission was flown aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 39A at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Falcon 9 is a startup. The flight computers have taken over the launch sequence. First and second stages are now beginning to pressurize for launch. LD is go for launch. Stage 2, pressing for flight. All systems are go for launch. Let's listen in to the final countdown because Falcon 9 takes our Starlink Stage one satellites tanks, pressing for flight. to orbit. 10, 9, Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition and lift off. Pitching down range. M1D performance is nominal. Successful liftoff for Falcon 9 from Pad 39A. Power and telemetry nominal. At Kennedy Space Center. There we just heard that power and telemetry is nominal. Moments ago, we began to throttle the nine Merlin engines. They're propelling the first stage through the atmosphere. We began to throttle them down in preparation for Max Q, also known as the. Max Q. All right, there we heard the call out. The vehicle just went through the moment in which it experiences the greatest aerodynamic pressure. In about a minute, we're going to have three events happening back to back. First will be main engine cutoff or MECO, where all nine M1D engines will shut down and slow the vehicle in preparation for event number two, stage separation. As the name indicates, this is where the first and second stages MVAC will separate. Uh, there we heard the call for MVAC engine chill, indicating that the second stage is preparing for that stage sep and ignition of MVAC. After stage separation, uh, stage one will start to make its way back to Earth for its landing on our drone ship and stage two will continue its journey with along with the third event uh, SCS-1 or second engine start one where MVAC will ignite and begin to propel the second stage along with the Starlink satellites to orbit. Miko. Stage separation confirmed. MVAC is now ignited and beginning to develop that warm orange glow. The next event we have coming up is fairing deployment. Fairing separation confirmed. Those fairings will make their way back to Earth as well. Second stage telemetry looks good. Everything is nominal there. Now, as it heads towards its targeted drop off orbit, first stage will execute two burns in order to make its way back to Earth. After main engine cutoff and stage separation, acquisition of signal Bermuda. It actually continues on an upward trajectory. Its maximum height gets about 132 kilometers, and right about now, it should it should have reached its apogee and now beginning to make its descent, coasting using its grid fins. And Both vehicles are following nominal trajectories. Good call out there, indicating nominal trajectory. Everything's looking good for both the first and second stages. Like I mentioned before, first stage will be performing two burns, the first being the entry burn, where three of the M1D engines will reignite. This helps to slow the stage down as it re-enters the upper part of the Earth's atmosphere. About two minutes later, the second burn will happen, and that is the landing burn. And this is where a single engine will reignite and bring the vehicle speed down rapidly as it prepares to land on our drone ship. Today's landing attempt will be with the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, which is currently located 350 nautical miles northeast of the Cape. The 60 Starlink satellites that we have on board today will be joining our constellation of nearly 700 already on orbit. Again, these satellites are designed to provide high speed, low latency, internet to us earthlings. This is especially useful in places where good internet is hard to access or impossible. Uh, so not only rural areas, but thinking about airplanes and ships will also be able to Stage one receive high-speed, reliable internet. Stage one, entry burn startup. Again, that was performed with three engines. Checking in on the second stage, everything continues to look nominal there. Stage one, entry burn shutdown. Trajectory is looking good. Both vehicles continue to follow nominal trajectories. The next Stage event one, entry transonic. The next event we have coming up in about 30 seconds is the first stage landing MVAC burn. throttling down. There we heard the call out for MVAC throttling down in preparation for second engine cutoff, which will happen just before T, my, T plus nine minutes. Terminal guidance. Stage one, landing burn startup. All right, we heard the call out that the landing burn for stage one has begun. This will last about 20 seconds. Stage two FTS is saved. Stage one, landing leg deploy. 
All right, confirmation hey, there. Landing confirmed. That this booster has landed for a second time. Second stage continues to look good. Normal orbital insertion. All right, and there we just heard the call out for good orbit for second stage. SpaceX had initially hoped to undertake this launch as part of a double header, with both the Seocom 1B and the Starlink 12 mission launching on the same day. That's something that a private operator has never done before. However, bad weather conditions prevented that from happening. Unlike several recent Starlink missions, which also carried other satellites for rideshare customers, this latest flight carried a full complement of 60 Starlink spacecraft. Meanwhile, there's growing concern that SpaceX's Starlink project will seriously hamper astronomical research. Starlink is placing thousands of broadband internet satellites into orbit. And despite assurances by SpaceX boss Elon Musk, the growing constellations already leaving an unavoidable imprint on the sky in the form of easily visible satellite trails. A new report by SATCOM-1, the Satellite Constellations Workshop, which was attended by more than 250 leading astronomers, warns that Starlink and similar large-scale constellations like it could have an extreme impact on astronomy and scientific progress. Over the past year alone, SpaceX Starlink launches have been changing the sky, with growing numbers of satellite trails contaminating astronomical images, ruining wide-field observations and affecting important scientific research. And the looming elephant in the room is that Starlink already has U.S. Federal Communications Commission approval to launch some 42,000 of the 260-kilogram satellites into a range of low-Earth orbits between 335 and 1,110 kilometres in altitude, with most expected to circle the planet around 570 kilometres up. Scientists use detailed computer simulations to determine how satellite constellations like Starlink, once fully deployed, would impact the operations of Earth-based observatories. They found that important searches for things like potentially dangerous near-Earth objects or even super-Earth exoplanet candidates could be missed because of the interference created by the satellite trails. Added to this is the unthinkable but highly likely possibility of a space junk cascade effect caused by so many satellites up there accidentally colliding in the ever more crowded skies. And that idea is likely to become a reality sooner than we think. In fact, one near miss has already occurred when SpaceX failed to move a satellite that had a 1 in a 1,000 chance of colliding with a European spacecraft. That's some 10 times higher than the European Space Agency's threshold for orbital avoidance manoeuvres. So unless something's done soon, scientists fear it's only a matter of time. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A 19-year-old German teen has been diagnosed with insulin-dependent diabetes after recovering from an asymptomatic COVID-19 infection. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, claims the patient was initially admitted to the emergency department of a local hospital with symptoms of diabetes. When his blood tests were carried out, they showed hallmarks of type 1 diabetes, something he never had before. But interestingly, they also indicated that he had been infected with the COVID-19 virus some five to seven weeks earlier. The authors say this case study does not indicate that COVID-19 caused the diabetes and it's possible he had a rare pre-existing condition and had simply gone through the past 19 years of his life undiagnosed. But they say it's possible that COVID-19 infected the pancreas, that's the organ which regulates blood sugar levels. The COVID-19 pandemic, which spread globally from its origins in Wuhan, China, has now killed more than 900,000 people worldwide, infecting more than 27 million others. A new study has shown that the risk of lung cancer death for social smokers, that is those who smoke less than 10 cigarettes a day, isn't all that much lower than for those smoking more than 20 cigarettes a day. A report to the European Respiratory Society's International Congress details a study of 18,730 people which found that compared to non-smokers, social smokers are more than twice as likely to die from lung disease and more than eight times as likely to die from lung cancer. Researchers say this suggests that cutting down or combining fewer cigarettes with vaping is no substitute for quitting completely. 
A new report by the International Atomic Energy Agency warns that Iran now has 10 times more enriched uranium than allowed under the terms of its 2015 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The United Nations nuclear watchdog says the Islamic Republic stockpile grew by some 533 kilograms since the agency's June report, and the June figure showed a 550 kilogram increase since the previous report in March, which in turn showed a 648 kilogram increase since the previous report in November 2019. Tehran's latest string of breaches follows news that Iran is building a new advanced centrifuge facility to replace the one destroyed by sabotage at its Natanz nuclear fuel plant in July. Centrifuges are a key component needed to process enriched uranium. The Iranian government says its new enrichment plant is being built hidden in the mountains near Natanz. The oil-rich nation insists its growing nuclear program is for peaceful power generation only. However, The International Atomic Energy Agency and Western intelligence sources believe Iran is continuing a coordinated clandestine nuclear weapons program which includes both atomic bombs and the long-range ballistic missiles needed to deliver them. A new study has concluded that Megalodon, an ancient giant relative of the modern-day white pointer shark Cacaridon cacarius, averaged around 16 metres or 53 feet in length. The study by scientists from Swansea University and the University of Bristol represents a fundamental step towards a better understanding of the physiology of this giant which dominated the world's oceans between 3 and 23 million years ago. Determining the true size of large sharks has always been difficult because their skeletons are made of cartilage which decays quickly, meaning teeth, often fossilised, are often all that's left. Today, the most fearsome living shark is Cacaronon cacarius, the great white or white pointer, which often reaches lengths of 7 metres or 22 feet and a mass of around 2.5 tonnes. However, records show that a great white shark captured in South Australian waters near Port Ferry in the 1870s was measured at 10.9 metres or 36 feet, while an individual trapped in a herring weir in New Brunswick, Canada in the 1930s was measured at a spectacular 11.3 metres or 37 feet. And for the record, that mechanical shark Bruce used in the movie Jaws, well, it was only 20 feet in length, a veritable pup. The authors of this new study say Megalodon's size suggests a bite force of more than 100,000 newtons, which is some two to three times that estimated for a T-Rex. Now, by comparison, modern-day great white sharks have a bite force of around 20,000 newtons. That compares to estuarine or saltwater crocodiles, which have a bite force of around 16,460 newtons, and lions and tigers, which have a bite force of around 4,450 newtons. The authors say the new study used a number of mathematical models to pin down the size and proportions of Megalodon based on close comparisons with a range of its modern-day close relatives, including great whites, makos, and port beagle sharks. Paranormal investigators are a hearty lot, willing to explore a world of shadows and mysteries at the drop of a hat. However, it seems that when it comes to the matter of strange shenanigans in their own homes, most Ghostbusters would hesitate, as Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics explains. This particular story that uh, was in an American sort of uh, publication was saying, should paranormal investigators investigate their own homes? And... Uh, the answer is no. And you think, why not? You know, what's good for the goose, et cetera. But uh, the article says no, because it's your own home, that uh, the spirits that are there will be upset because you have a more professional approach and they'll take it out on you. Poltergeist will be out there. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, they say that it's best to leave sleeping ghosts lie in your own home. <laughs> right. Yeah. In your own home. But I mean, why? I mean, so, you know, anyway, because you need time off, the article suggests, actually, as a paranormal hunter. So don't take your work home with you. How big is the paranormal home investigation? industry? There's certainly groups that go around and I, I know a number of them actually and I know people who work with them or who are part of them. Um, there's enough, you, mean, you, you can find them, you can find them pretty easily, especially in most cities, you'll find a whole range of groups that uh, will offer their services, they tend to go around for some reason in camouflage gear or military looking gear. Makes so the ghosts more, don't uh, see them? I don't know. <laughs> Are they driving around in converted ambulances or anything like that? Quite possibly. I mean, why not? That with these machines on their backs, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Sp- converted vacuum on their back. Yes. 
Uh, but they do tend to go around in sort of, they, they would like to wear uniforms. I mean, I don't know why, with, you know, with a logo on, on, on the breast, et cetera. And, uh, and they're most of they tend to be sort of military type specs. And, and but, what, uh, they, what about their equipment that they use? There's got to be some exclusive ghost hunting equipment that you need when you're, when you're looking for <laughs> ectoplasmic sources. It's a lot of gear that sort of, Sold normally, not as ghost hunting things, but that are then labelled ghost hunting, which means the price goes up. EMF, you know, electromagnetic frequencies, so you can pick up that you know, with a meter, etc. It's called a radio. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, all sorts of, apart from the physical little tools for measuring and that sort of stuff, infrared cameras, a whole range of stuff that most of it's readily available if you can do it yourself if you really want to. But of course, you don't have the experience and professional approach that a paranormal <laughs> investigator would. Oh, um, no, we again. Very impressed that you say that with a straight face. <laughs> we published an article not long ago in our magazine written by a paranormal investigator pointing out all the terrible things that paranormal investigators do, apart from trampling down your garden. But they have a lot of problems with their attitudes. He doesn't know anyone who really approaches it totally seriously. That uh, He did a survey of uh, paranormal investigation groups and was rather disappointed by the slackness. What, and that's true. That's true of a lot of these. Very diligent at their job or slackness in that they know yeah. what they're doing is a load of crap and they're giggling as they do it. I don't think he asked them, do you believe what you're doing? Certainly the practices they do, that they don't do proper research or proper preparation and that sort of stuff. And when they're there, they're pretty um, amateurish. Most, well, most of them are amateurish, actually. I don't think there's a lot of money to be made out of uh, ghost hunting in Australia. Is there any rural research being done by universities into it? Not many that would own up to it. We did many years ago published a, uh, a series of articles about what we call degrees of woo. Degrees of woo. But, uh, yeah, which is basically all some of the strange things that is being taught in universities. Most of it was about very dodgy health areas, but there were other ones that people talking about auras and uh, all sorts of strange things. Yeah, it was, we, we did a big study on that actually, and it's quite horrifying. It, it tends to be individual academics, except in the health areas where it's actually part of the university curriculum. What? And that sort of stuff. Yeah, oh yeah. RMIT was notorious. You've got to tell me more. RMIT at one stage had a veterinary acupuncture course. They were one of the major chiropractic universities, and they were teaching subluxation and all this sort of stuff. RMIT he actually responded when he wrote to all the universities saying, please, how do you substantiate this in, a, in your uh, classes and things? And most of them usually you know, didn't respond. We published it anyway. But I mean, RMIT did. They were very upset that we should dare criticise or suggest that what they were teaching was uh, dodgy. This is the same and RMIT who are the university consultants for the Australian Space Agency's new spacesuit that they're now developing. That's... I think you have to, yeah, but you've got to separate out different faculties, right? <laughs> That, that, uh, and different particular academics as well. But the fact that these were officially sanctioned courses within, within the university, that's the concern, which is why we approach the vice chancellors rather than necessarily the individual um, professors. But uh, some of them were amazing, which is shocking. And that was actually, that actually led to the founding of the Friends of Science in Medicine group, which is uh, challenging academics and that sort of stuff. We did a bit of diligent research, looking up basically every university's calendar of courses and you know, some of them teaching homeopathy. It would be one thing to teach it as a research activity to do assessments to see if it works. It's another thing teaching it as a professional training, and that's what most of them are doing. They were doing it as professional training, which is a worry. That's Tim Mindham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, Podbeam, Android, Castbox, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Space Time online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to commercial-free double episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through spacetimewithstuartgary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, 
at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 